Good morning, everyone. Today, I am joined by Claudia Winkler and Alice Schmidt, and I'm very excited to be here with them today. These two women are, you know, really career oriented and have so much experience in the sustainability world. Alice Schmidt has been spent more than 20 years addressing a wide range of social, environmental, and economic sustainability issues. She's worked with UN agencies, the European Commission, the African Union, and the World Bank to host in a host of different NGOs, as well as many large corporations and small enterprises in 30 plus countries over four continents. Besides teaching students about sustainable business and management for the future, she also runs a boutique sustainability consultancy firm. Therefore, her experience and her expertise is far and wide. And Claudia Winkler is an internationally recognized award-winning social innovator, entrepreneur, and serial founder. She believes in the power of shaping a positive tomorrow by transforming traditional business models that will work for the next generation. Her passion for sharing corporate executive experience in managing leading international tech companies to coach and impact initiatives around the world is remarkable. Claudia also consults organizations on technology, digital transformation, and innovation for a more sustainable future. So thank you guys both so much for being here with us today. Um, it's definitely a pleasure to have you. And to top it all off, they've built on their joint 40 plus years of experience to recently publish a book called The Sustainability Puzzle, which explores how systems thinking, circularity, climate action, and social transformation can and will improve health, wealth, and the well-being for all. So thank you both for being here today. I'm really excited to hop into some of these sustainability related questions about circularity and the future and how we're really going to make tomorrow better. So thank you again for being here and I'm very excited. Thank you, Madison. We're really happy to be here. Thank you. So I guess we can just you know jump into the questions here and get your perspective on some of these really pressing topics about sustainability. Um, there's no doubt that your expertise you know, can speak to these questions and really excited to hop into them. So first, maybe you both can talk to you how you are currently focusing your efforts to transform the supply chain and, and or economic sphere to be more sustainable. Claudia, I'll let you start off on that. Yeah, I, I start with a more general perspective. Uh, I'm a generalist. My background is business, corporate, and uh, for the past five years, I have been founding sustainable ventures all around Europe. And actually, what I do on a daily basis is uh, using my knowledge and my energy and my passion how to build businesses uh, for creating businesses that, that are fit for the future. Because I strongly believe in the hypothesis that we humans are creative and whatever we do, we can use for the outcome we want to. So we can use all our energy and all our passion to shape a meaningful future and uh, have a positive impact. And that's what I'm trying to do with my tech background, with my product development background, contributing to a green and fair future for all of us. Yeah, and I'll just um, sort of um, build on that because obviously Claudia and I have a lot in common. Um, I mean, for me, um, sustainability uh, is very much all it was a, it's all about value chains, right? Um, and it's very much about taking responsibility for um, the entirety of, of one's value chain as a company. Uh, and so, I mean, I enjoy working with companies and, and other types of organizations in really analyzing the value chain. And I, I mean, I only work with those where I feel that who, who have a real interest, a very serious sort of genuine, honest interest in making their impact along the value chain, trans chain transparent and to really create um, partnerships that benefit all, uh, all partners, right, all, all players, uh, including sort of uh, the, the communities that are sort of towards the end of the value chain. Um, so, I mean, you know, th this includes working on a lot of social issues in value chains, you know, which we know about in, in terms of fast fashion, but also say, for example, in hazelnut picking, um, you know, in Turkey, uh, it's about, um, you know, palm oil. I mean, there's so many, so many different issues that um, that come into play in value chains. Of course, they differ across industries, um, 
And but and perhaps also a more topical because I don't work only with companies. I also work in the not-for-profit world, as you've mentioned, uh, for example, with the European Commission. And there is about understanding how value chains, supply chains, can be developed in a way that vaccines, yeah, COVID vaccines in this case, but of course that's not just limited to COVID vaccines, are um, developed in the countries where they're needed. So that, for example, African countries don't necessarily depend on importing them from um, you know, countries in Europe or in the States or from the States, but where they actually get to start building up their own production capacity. And of course that has a, um, a social sustainability impact as well. That's great. There's definitely so many areas. And I think that's interesting that you bring up the idea of value chains and how that really is the core in figuring out that when a company or a country has an invested interest, it's very important to moving those efforts forward. And I think we can kind of jumping off of that in both of your current efforts. Um, I know that you both have expertise and experience in multiple areas of sustainability because sustainability isn't just talking about the environment. It's not just talking about the social networks. It's not just talking about the economies. But I think it's important that I get your opinion on the idea of how do we find the proper balance between maintaining or achieving even economic sustainability and environmental sustainability at, at the same time? Because you know, there is a, a push and pull here. We want to, you know, protect the planet, but there is, a, you know, business interest here in a lot of cases uh, for the people operating the value chains, as well as, you know, there's social impacts that we need to be aware of. So how do you think that it's the best way or, you know, some ways that we could find the proper balance? We have a very clear vision on that. And our vision is that there is no economy without taking in consideration social and economic uh, environment more or less because uh, our uh, we believe that and lots of people believe start believing that in the past we were too much focused on the economic uh, economic um, impact of our actions and social and environmental actions were just you know like on the side you did it not to harm your community or not to harm the environment Alice uh, taught me a very nice um, you know, like figure for that, she's, she called it Mickey Mouse thinking. So in the center, there's the big head, the economic um, activities. And then there are small ears, like the, uh, the social and the ecological um, activities. And this uh, thinking actually is very outdated. So most of us uh, by now are aware of the triple bottom line concept, a term coined by John Elkinton in um, some 15 years ago, uh, which says you have to balance all these three factors and have to find an intersection. But our thinking goes far beyond that. We believe that eco the economy needs to be uh, embedded in the social and environmental uh, sphere. So the economy has to be part of it and has to take care of all these things in order to survive. So that's, that's our very yeah, very Definitely. strong definition strong how, how we see. And we see it as, as you mentioned, also medicine, it's social, economic and environmental dimension that we have to get right in order to be truly sustainable. But it's not like finding the intersections, but embed the economy in the social and environmental activities. So Definitely. we turn it around. <laughs> because I think that's very true, you know, you. You won't have these economies without having a planet. So we really need to focus on the environment. You know, I think that's very, Alice, maybe you can speak to that. You're Mickey Mouse thinking that's very unique and a really great metaphor as well. So, yeah, so someone said Mickey Mouse is dead after we spoke to them. Uh, and uh, I, I, so, yeah, this, this Mickey Mouse thinking is still very prevalent. What's also still very prevalent is this idea that we're saving the planet, right? We read that all the time. We're saving the planet. We're saving the environment. And a lot of people do not realize that they're actually saving themselves, right? They're saving the planet's ability to continue powering us, feeding us, um, you know, nurturing us, providing medicine, regulating our climate. Um, you know, we can call these the, the ecosystem services or the planetary services. And I mean, it's, it's absolutely clear that the entire economy 
all of us humans depend on this. And it's because of these services, this very unique mix of services that planet Earth has been providing to us as humans, we've been able to develop the way we were able to develop, right? Um, and, you know, with all our technological progress, um, various revolutions now, you know, industrial revolution. Um, but what what's interesting is also that in a way, abusing those services, yeah, just taking those services without consider consideration for what's left was apparently in our interest for until some time ago. It made us healthier and wealthier and so on. But now we've so, sort of, you know, we've overstepped a limit and we're now um, possibly um, digging our own grave. I mean, we, we are optimists, Claude and I are optimists, but um, we really think it's very important to, 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 to make that clear. Yeah, it's, it's our own human well-being, even civilization that's at risk. So there isn't a real, um, it's not one or the other, right? Um, there, it's, it's, it's one sort of the economy depends on nature and we as humans, we depend on nature. And yeah, and, and we just need to, a system, yeah, but the, the, the system we've created within nature, our political economic system needs to reflect that. And one way for it to reflect that is by just making room and calculating the costs of unsustainability. At the moment, we're not pricing that in, right? At the moment, we're still subsidizing fossil fuels with millions uh, and billions of dollars um, when it should be uh, the other way around, right? Definitely. I think another thing is to just think about, we need to just change the mindset of uh, there's some type of benefit, you know, as humans to quick, immediate, short-term reward. But if we change the mindset, you know, because as well as like you both, I'm also an optimist on this topic. And I think that it really is a shift in mindset and showing that there's benefit to the idea of good things take time and having that futuristic mindset and knowing that, yes, maybe if you maintain using fossil fuels, you might have great wealth in the short term, but look 10 years down the line. And I think the use of value chains and mapping those out and showing that you know these value chains need to be sustained and that's not going to be possible without balancing that bottom triple bottom line there, you know, that's important. And I think it really is being three optimistic people here, showing that the future is almost is more important and is as important as our present actions. And I guess moving on from this, maybe you both can talk to the difference between what you think sustainability is in supply chain versus circularity in supply chain. I talk to people from around the world and this is always a topic where some people think that circularity is a part of sustainability where others think that sustainability is a part of circularity. And you know, at the end of the day, as long as we're working on both, I think that it's a really great step for the right direction, but it is important to see you know, where people think these fit together. Yeah, so great question. And perhaps I'll start on this one. Um, I mean, first of all, we, Claudia and I, um, have a very broad understanding of sustainability, as you've pointed out, Madison, right? So we don't focus just on the environmental pillar, but very much on the social and economic pillar as well. Um, that's one thing. And so if we really have to decide, you know, what's what and which is sort of bigger than which, I would also say that sustainability is the, broad, is the broader term and circularity comes within that. But what I think is important is that to understand that circularity is very much about materials, about resources, about this taking, making and wasting. Yeah, in our linear model where we essentially, we take stuff from the earth, we um, make something with it, we produce it, sometimes we, use it for a while sometimes you know you we use it for a few minutes and then we throw it away and at the moment pretty much everything so 93 percent or something of what we take from the earth gets wasted yeah and so a circular system a circular economy would basically turn this into a loop so that we would almost eliminate waste yeah and waste is a social concept anyway so what's Waste today uh, in you know Austria, where we are at the moment, might be considered resource somewhere else. Yeah, uh, I personally have been known to using things that other people have thrown away. I, I love secondhand, right? So uh, I, I really think this this is important. And of course, the other thing is that the social 
is not so explicitly part of the circular economy. Obviously, the social the circular economy benefits society, right? Very much. It, 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 it's what what it's essential, right, for sustainability. But it doesn't have so much of a focus on that. It has more of a focus on, on the environmental aspects and the resource uh, use and so on. Uh, and I, I can talk more about the circular economy, but I'll let Claudia go first. I think Alice, Alice uh, mentioned the most important dimensions of our thinking, and I would not add much to that. I think she summed it up quite well. So uh, I, I just can nod my head and say, yes, 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 Alice, uh, that, that's basically it. <laughs> yeah, no, great. Thank you for uh, trusting <laughs> uh, my judgment as well. Um, so Madison, then perhaps, I mean, what, I, what I'd like to add is, because that also is something that is not always understood, that circularity really starts in a design stage. It's not once something is produced that one should start thinking about how to repair it not. or, yeah. It's always, you know, you have to implement that in the beginning because there's a lot of, what I like to see it as many small circles within that circular, that circular thinking. So if you begin to have that innovative mindset at the beginning of your supply chain, beginning of your value chain, you may find other circles within the first stages of production even, or you know how to connect that to maybe another sector or industry. Maybe you can't use your waste, but maybe if you're producing robotics and maybe the textile industry could use that for buttons or you know finding other, other uses that you might not even think of. So it really is a, it's a mindset that has to be thought of in the beginning. And maybe there, I still have to add something now, something came to my mind, uh, the whole uh, factor of uh, technology, new technologies coming in, enabling circularity. So I think one of the big tools and catalysts for circular economy is uh, techno availability of technology. Let's, let's just think of how things are produced, how to predict what's in there, how to like um, work with it, how to, uh, yeah. <laughs> put it back in the circle that's a lot of technology and technology is advancing and this also helps circularity so first is changing the mindset being aware that new tools are available constantly changing being updated and those enable even more circular models uh, than up to now that these things might have been a barrier up to now but you know like things are advancing day by day so new models are becoming possible by technology and i think that's an important thing to keep in mind when you look at things maybe if you looked at a problem half a year ago it was not feasible to think in in uh, uh, to, to develop a circular business model but maybe if you have a look again half a year later there might be new tools available that help you part of the optimism we want to spread technology is also supporting a lot of the developments um, that we need to uh, create a sustainable future great definitely i agree with you on that um, there's definitely so many technologies and changes that are coming out and and i think that those can help or sometimes hurt you know pressing global issues that are currently going on and i think jumping off of that i'd like to ask you know, what do you both believe are the most pressing global issues currently in terms of achieving or finding global sustainability and these social transformation processes for the better? And on top of these issues, you know, what are the current solutions or through your work, what, how are you addressing these, you know, either their social or environmental issues? Where do you, where do you stand on that? Well, where to start? I mean, there are so many um, global issues, right? But I think the most pressing ones and uh, obviously are, you know, climate change, biodiversity loss, um, and related to that also a lack of a circular economy. I think one can definitely say that. I mean, with climate change just this morning, I, I looked at some recent data from the European Union where 93%, I think, of citizens across the European Union actually recognizes climate recognize climate change as the most pressing global issue um, and and you know all of them see this something very serious and interestingly in many countries you know around two-thirds of the population actually think it's the 
business of business. So it's it's business and industry that needs to that's res responsible for sorting that out, right? But then of course climate change isn't the only uh, one. There is biodiversity loss, and the two are linked. And and by the way, I think it's important to to keep in mind that also uh, circularity and climate change are linked, right? Because almost half of the emissions um, that sort of the, the greenhouse gas emissions that we produce come out of products that could be cycled and yeah? not just recycled because recycling is kind of uh, almost like a last resort, but that could be cycled. And um, yeah, so we, we really need, as you've said before, Madison, a paradigm shift, a complete rethink to, to what it is we, we, we we are doing and how we're doing it, our definition of progress, of where we want to be. Um, I mean, so, you know, social injustice, of course, relates to that because we see companies becoming so powerful that um, regulation, even if it's tough regulation, say by the European Union or, you know, the US government, um, may not be that powerful anymore. Yeah, for various reasons, we all know about lobbying, etc. And I think this is something that's 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 a trend that has accelerated in recent years, and which makes it a bit risk harder to 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 respond to some of these things. But yeah, Claudia, I'm sure will step in and, and also see the the positive role that that corporations can play. And of of course, I see that. Um, so um, the, then, the last point I just want to come back to is the cost argument. Yeah, I think this is something we all need to understand the costs of sustainability and really start measuring. Uh, what matters, and and what we all can do, and what I'm doing, because you asked, like, how do you take that take that up in your pro professional life? Well, besides consulting and doing studies along those lines, I mean, I teach students, right? And I think this is very important. I mean, I I, I teach business students from around the globe, and I really love when they tell me after th that you know I've, I've opened their eyes in a way, or that you know they've 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 really sort of made a leap forward in terms of the their their thinking, and so. I think all of us can, in a way, you know, influence peers and and our professional partners, our families, and everybody. All of us can make a difference, really, along the supply chain. I like that you bring up the idea of students because I think that for those that might not have experience with, you know, they don't get the chance to learn in the classroom setting. Maybe it's just kind of how they take it and and experience it in their own life. But what we, what people don't realize is a lot of these like global pressing issues actually involves sustainability which and climate change, but those topics as well involve human health and the idea of population growth and other issues that might not just be about when you think, oh, the, the temperature is rising. There's so many other issues that are connected to this larger picture. And so when you start to teach students about that, they really see that the human does have a, a really strong impact. And then, you know, the eyes begin to open and there's, it, it makes it starts to make a lot more sense, you know, why this is such an immediate pressing issue. We could not agree more because, you know, like the main thing is understanding that it's all interconnected and that we need a holistic thinking looking at the problem before we zoom in and address certain issues like circularity or climate action or whatever. So it's it's all interconnected. So the social aspect and the ecological aspect, uh, just one thing that is known to all of us but uh, you need to mention it also all the time. People most affected by climate change are already those people who are already now uh, the ones most disadvantaged. So this is, uh, um, it's making the inequality even bigger. And I think this is also something we all have to keep in mind. But I don't want to like be now in a doom uh, state of, this, of the discussion because actually what we want to bring along is a positive message because yes the problems are huge and there are huge challenges and they require a huge transformational effort but uh, we believe it's doable and why do we believe it's doable because we believe that the way we started working recently understanding that we are solving wicked problems that we have to have a different approach and that some challenges have to be addressed by basically trial and error and this startup mindset of addressing these challenges might come in handy because none of us is smart enough to solve the problem on its own no single individual no single country no single company we all have to work together on this so it's a lot about collaboration opening up getting different views admitting that you can't get it right on yourself and then start with small steps uh, iterate, prototype, try things out, see what works. And those things that work will, you know, then get the push to be the, to be scaled. Uh, and I think that's the mindset uh, that we need to uh, be open 
that we might not have the full solution in the beginning, but if we continue iterating on whatever we do, we might get forward. And that's a call to action to all of us if we work on sustainability issues. Don't get scared by the huge problem. Just think of what can I do in my field of responsibility, what, which small step I can take. Um, then I do this step, I get positive enforcement, and then I do the next step and the next step and the next step. And I think with this kind of thinking, this slicing the elephant thinking, that's also like quite popular in the agile way of thinking, we can address this topic if we all work together and collaborate on the issue. So okay. that's my positive message for the day. I when we discuss the negative ones. Of course, I think sometimes, you know, the, the idea and there's that, you know, anxiety behind how large the problem is, but if you maintain a positive outlook and you really think of what you can do as an individual, what you can do in your professional career, what you can do working with other professionals and kind of look at it, how you can kind of target specific issues that are in your control or, you know, what you can do to contribute while you are here on this planet. Um, you know, that's the important thing. And it's just making those small steps, which will eventually add up to large transformations. And I think it's funny uh, to explain it kind of in a way of looking at a, a large holistic view, like we were talking about. First, if you're sick, you might go to a, a general doctor. And then from there, they kind of survey everything and then they bring in the specialists, right? So maybe you bring in a specialist on the environment, you bring in a specialist on value chains and the economy, and you bring in a specialist on social issues. But at first you look at the holistic view because you don't wanna just miss a whole leg or a whole arm. You need to really look at the entire body and that's kind of how I see the sphere of sustainability, right? Excellent analogy. <laughs> yeah, re really good this analogy. Great, right? Matt, this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is great. We will steal this from you for our next stop. <laughs> Of course. And, you know, it's, that's what I'm here for. You know, I'd love to learn from people and you guys inspire me. I hope to, you know, add something to you as well. But, you know, moving on from that, one of those arms might be a supply chain manager. And at ISCEA, we are a supply chain alliance. So we do work with a lot of supply chain professionals. And the question always is from our global members, you know, what can they do to implement circular thinking and technology into their organizations? Um, you know, what activities Will help them work toward that social global transformation. And Alice, I know you have a lot of value chain experience and that's one of your passions. So maybe you can speak to that point here and talk about where you see that mid to upper level supply chain managers can really implement this circular technology or thinking. Uh, yeah, so I'm happy to start on this. I mean, first of all, I think they, those managers, um, you know, the top management of the organization really has to understand circularity. I really think this, and, and this, this, this is, it might seem obvious, but I don't think, uh, but, I, but I think it still needs to be mentioned because it's not always the case, right? And then, so creating this, this, this awareness, the sense of urgency, but then coupled with this sense that it's doable is, is really, really important. Um, and, and I think very quickly, uh, or one of the first things that any organization needs to do, and, and those managers basically need to work, you know, the work with is, is, is an analysis of their entire supply chain. Of course, you have to draw the line somewhere. It's, it's very difficult to, to do, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, as you know, right? To analyze the total global supply chain, but you have to take into account and you have to take responsibility for what your at least um, sort of first tier partners do and you should actually go down much much further right and these days a lot of companies aren't going that much further essentially they don't, they don't know under what conditions uh, uh, their you know say clothes are, are produced so it's really this analysis that's that's absolutely essential uh, and when doing this analysis being very open uh, and really trying to learn and and also being transparent I mean you can start by being transparent internally right? you don't have to make every issue you're facing as a manager um, known to the to the world even though personally I do think you know we should all be very transparent and collaborative and and, and there shouldn't be any secrets and then in the end it's also about pre-competitive agreements right because some um, supply chain issues can only be served at, uh, solved at that level and I give you an example I mean I um, I worked with um, uh, Ferrero, a large, uh, well, you know, confectionery company, and, and it was all about improving working conditions and eliminate, eliminating 
uh, child labor in, in one of their several value chains, uh, including hazelnuts, right? Um, and, and the issues they're facing are, of course, very similar for all companies that buy from local farmers. And the question then is, um, how do you address these issues at the at the bigger level, at the societal level, right? So this is also an openness to actually to actually partner and and give away uh, well some of your some of your secrets uh, potentially. Uh, I let I let Claudia continue. Maybe then there's yeah more for sure. Yeah. I, I, think... I, I, I totally love listening to Alice because uh, she's very advanced on the topic, and here I come in with my experience. Circularity was pretty new to me over the past years, and I learned a lot from Alice when we wrote this book. And I think one thing we need to understand when addressing this topic, as we're also talking with people studying and getting into a new field, we need to pick, pick up people where they are. So we cannot expect everyone that works on the supply chain being aware of circularity, basic principles and what to think. So the, I think the first thing is being aware of that this is a topic that might be very new to a lot of people and that we need to put effort into educating and informing people on, on that. And I think what you do, Madison, is very important. So uh, educating, um, exchanging experience in industries and stuff like that, because we are in a transformation process. And you cannot take it for granted that, you know, like everybody understands what we're talking about when we talk about circularity. And I of always course. say, I have to admit myself that this was new to me. So don't be afraid if it's the first time you hear about how circularity in detail works, it's okay because, you know, like it's a new topic, we all have to get into it. Just get started, read a book, inform yourself, yeah. talk to people who have more experience, do some courses and classes, they're popping up all over the globe. They weren't there two years ago. So that's a new topic Definitely. and it's okay that it's new and just, you know, like get into the mood of it. If, if this is the first step you do, it's already a, a great step forward after this talk. So yes. uh, if you listen to us, it's okay if you don't understand everything from the beginning, just uh, get get interested in the topic because it's something that will form our future. For sure, and I think- Sorry ISCA, for keeping it that basic, no, but it's- of course. We, our CSSCP program, which is our Sustainable Supply Chain Professional Certification Program was designed in mind to understand that, you know, these these managers or you know professionals may have supply chain and probably do have supply chain experience but we wanted to keep the course structured in a way that they understood it as their supply chain and then supplement the course with best practice examples of sustainable implementation so it really puts that idea that these these transformations are attainable they're already being done somewhere uh, industry leader has already implemented this so the idea is not so scary it's that optimistic spin and showing that it's possible you know these are large issues, but if we make these small changes along the supply chain, along, you know, the circular systems, we can really make a difference. And that's the key here that, you know, at ISA, we want to show that we want to help you further not only your supply chain education and helping, you know, scale that economy, but also realizing that you don't have to compromise your supply chain to be sustainable, because I think there's always a lot of, I know you guys think that environmental sustainability is number one and the economy should fit inside of that, like we talked about in the beginning. Uh, so of course we wanna show that both of those things are very important and you know we need to focus on all aspects, including the environment and the economy. Yeah, and just to add to that, because I think sometimes the changes are going to be quite radical, and it, it, you know, it, you'd start, you'd start not with the supply chain manager, but you'd start with the R and D department that really tries to figure out with technology, with you know, thinking outside the box, with engaging lots of partners, supply chain part, including supply chain partners, and saying how can we produce this product, this bra or this um, whatever toilet seat, yeah, to use very basic yeah. examples differently uh, how can we do that and and very often the answer is in reducing the number of of um, different materials that go into one product right and in and this is part of 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 um designing for circularity very early on in this design stage of course and it's also about a, a practical tool that people i think understand is also the material passport right that um that product, say garments that, you know, um, 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 consist of composite materials are much easier to cycle and recycle and reuse if, if the, the companies involved, um, you know, further down the value chain actually know what to do with it. Um, this, is, this, is, this makes more eco economic sense. It makes more environmental sense. It's more efficient. Um, 
And then also, I think, looking for opportunities further down the, the value chain, right, including how to involve people at the base of the pyramid, which make up 4, million, 4 billion people, right, uh, across the world in your supply chain as, as you know, um, as, as employees, as consumers, but also as, as, as entrepreneurs, as partners. And there's a lot of um, uh, initiatives uh, and very successful initiatives, economically successful initiatives um, in this inclusive business space, as it's called. Definitely, I think that's very important. You know, I think that our course, like you're talking about, you know, we do see a lot of product engineers even getting involved in that because like you said, it's not just the supply chain managers, it's every role, you know, in every corporation needs this baseline, at least understanding of sustainability, because if you're restructuring your, if you don't create your product with the idea that you want to be able to regenerate or recycle or reuse, you know, you're going to get to the end stage and say, oh, oh no, the product is made of 10, 11, 12 materials. And it's really hard here to then recycle that, to reuse that. So if we do go back and teach the you know, product engineers, the R&D department about these things, we're going to have a more success later on, right? And I think we've talked about so much today, but I want to end highlighting your, your book. And I would love to know, can you guys both just speak about the sustainability puzzle um, you know, maybe it's scope or your inspiration for writing, anything you'd like to share with our members and, you know, anyone that views this video today, just highlight that that publication and I'd love to hear about it. So I, I'll try to share my screen perhaps to, to ex uh, explain some of this and, and maybe Claudia wants to start talking about how it all came about while I do this. Would you, would you mind making yeah. me a host? So okay. while, while, while Alice show, uh, brings up her screen, I think the story of how this all came about is quite interesting because it's again about, uh, you know, like a transformational process, picking up people where they are, bringing them along and bringing them together. So Alice and me come at sustainability from different perspectives. And uh, yeah, we exchanged a lot of thoughts with people from all of the all of the globe uh, over the past year uh, in online meetings every Friday morning like traditional virtual coffees basically and there we gained a lot of knowledge and different perspectives and we tried to put those together in our book the sustainability puzzle which is aimed at people who are maybe familiar with one or two aspects of the whole sustainability sphere, but maybe not with all, who are new to the topic, but also to experts who want to get a deeper knowledge in some of the dimensions. And what we came up with is a holistic overview of the sustainability topic. And I hand over to Alice now uh, to explain our key concepts and gifts. Yeah, thank you, Claudia. So in, in making this accessible to audiences, yeah, because we very deliberately uh, wanted to go beyond academic audience, be beyond the converted, right? Because often we're preaching to the converted in the sustainability space. We included um, sort of, yeah, graphic art like this, where we um, basically try to summarize our argument and we do this for each chapter. And this is basically the canvas that, sub that uh, summarizes our entire argument. So it's really about Zooming out first, um, just like you've explained so beautifully, Madison, um, you know, going to a GP before then going and see the specialized. So looking at the bigger picture, putting on a systems lens, applying system thinking uh, and moving out of the sectoral silos, right, within which we work, um, but within which we cannot solve any problems really, right? And only then, once we've done this, um, we must zoom in and, and basically address these puzzle pieces as we've defined them uh, uh, one by one or all together and, and also establish the links between them and, and understanding how they uh, influence each other and essentially trying to create win-wins. Yeah, So create um, environmental, social and economic wins at the same time. Yes, yeah? so we can also call this multi-solving. Um, and, and as sort of well, a bit of ingredient, as sort of extra ingredients in all of this, yeah? So think of it as the herbs, maybe, yeah? It's important to, to remain optimistic, to keep collaborating across sectors, across silos, across countries, across any boundary you, you, you might imagine. Uh, measuring along the way, measuring what matters, so not just measure, measuring economic growth, GDP, but actually measuring societal well-being, progress. Um, and looking for these win-wins. And so this is, this is our overall sort of argument in a way of, of how we feel 
uh, it's possible to create health, wealth, and well-being um, for all um, with sustainability. Uh, and then just because we've been speaking about the circular economy um, so much today, um, I'd, I'd like to show as an example what we've done for each chapter in this book. Um, and because it was important for us to not just highlight the problem, but actually to also look at what the solutions are and what each individual can do, what organizations can do, and what governments can do, right? And so with the circular economy, and this is really about a paradigm shift, uh, products being designed to fail, planned obsolescence is a huge problem we haven't actually spoken about today. Uh, that's when uh, products are deliberately designed in a way that they break easily or uh, become unfashionable easily, which of course leads to a growing waste problem, which leads to all sorts of health issues, environmental issues, um, both on land and the ocean. And so it's about this rethink of waste as resources and applying the many R's that you're very familiar with, Madison, the refuse, refuse reduce, reuse, refurbish, recycle, and many others. Um, and really designing for repairability um, and basically yeah, keeping materials essentially in the loop as long as possible and potentially forever, right? And so for individuals, for consumers, this means potentially buying less, but buying better, yeah? buying only what they really love, perhaps spending more per item, but then investing in high quality items, um, repairing things when they break. And of course, this also means a whole repair system needs to, I mean, it's there already, but it needs to be come stronger and more present and people need to become more aware of it, right? It's also changing business models from, from um, you know, ownership to renting and sharing, because um, this is a key part of it. So this, this whole product of a product is a service idea. Um, and, and yeah, again, you can't do that without partners along the entire value chain. And governments have an important role to play. I mean, they are still very powerful despite what I said in the beginning. So it's really about penalizing, uh, penalizing planned obsolescence, promoting quality, promoting things, sort of so services like repair cafes. There's some great um, models out there at the moment um, which employ people with, you know, with certain disabilities or, or people coming out, um, you know, from certain institutions and that need to be reintegrated into society. So it's really this triple win. It saves you money. You have your thing prepared. You keep the things that you love for much longer. It's an environmental benefit, um, you know, fewer materials used, fewer emissions, Plus, it has a social benefit for, for, for people that otherwise might not have a job. So it's really a win, 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 win. Um, and then, yes, uh, incentivizing the use of product packs, passports. And essentially, we keep coming back to this cost and tax and, and true cost accounting argument, yeah? including by taxing waste, yeah, because that's obviously a, a big incentive for us to produce less waste. Um, so this is, one, this is one chapter. I mean, I could now show you other chapter summaries, but yeah. let's see how we're doing for diet. I think Claudia is also saying this is enough. We've we've <laughs> we've um, blessed you with our yes, wisdom. Yes, there's no, <laughs> no doubt that this publication this this is very transformative, very innovative, and I think it's a really great a really great read for those that are looking to learn more about you know what it what this means for supply chain and what circularity means. Um, so definitely. We will provide you know access for how there it is to to find the book and where we can really grab that if they're interested we're happy to circulate this for you i know i will be reading this soon i'm very excited to get my hands on this i'm always looking for new sustainability books um i have a favorite so maybe this will become my new favorite i always you know circle through them so i'm very excited to to get my hands on this cover and i'll let you guys know what i think of it after i complete the read, but I wanna thank you both for being here today and discussing these topics with me. There's no doubt that we're all in agreement that you know it really is a holistic approach to sustainability, including you know social, environment, economic change. And I want us all to leave here today sharing that message of optimism, knowing that there are a lot of global issues, but we aren't at a place where we can't you know make better changes, we can't work for the better, innovate for the better. So I think we're all on the same page there. And thank you so much again for your time. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you guys and look forward to future conversations as well. Thank you, Madison. It's been a pleasure and great questions. So we really had a blast. Thanks a lot for taking the time and exchanging thoughts. We learned something. Yeah, and also for reaching out to us. Thank you.